This is Lecture 11, Practical, Efficient Coronary Analysis and Clinical Interpretation, specifically applicable to coronary CT angiography. The prime reminder here is this is a CT scan of the heart, its chambers, the coronary arteries, and local vasculature. As such, your assignment is to perform a systematic review of these components. In particular, you need to review the chambers, their sizes, and the pericardium. You need to review the proximal pulmonary veins and included aorta, ascending and descending. You need to define left ventricular size, thickness, global and regional function if it's a retrospective study. And importantly, you need to find segmental coronary artery anatomy, which is usually the prime objective of the study. Finally, you need to define the coronary calcium score, but there's more later in the last lecture in the series on this particular aspect. So the important thing is you can view and interpret the images from the tomographic or transaxial source images. And many of the experts in the area just merely look at the transaxial images and try to uh, understand what's happening in between them. But frankly, we do not recommend that. We recommend as a routine, as a powerful workstation that allows you to do three-dimensional manipulations, this affords an almost infinite number of two-dimensional and three-dimensional displays which facilitate interpretation and problem solving. Just the same, you need a routine. And this routine is essential. You have a routine anytime you look at anything. If you look at a chest radiograph, if you look at an abdominal CAT scan, if you look at an echocardiogram, if you look at a, a coronary or a peripheral angiogram, you have a routine for analysis to be sure from the beginning to the end that you've looked at all of the salient components. The same thing is absolutely essential when you look at CT coronary arteriography. So you must have an efficient and a consistent interpretation approach. And then at the end, you need to have adequate and standardize report generation. So in the following slides, I outline my personal approach to this goal. The Society of Cardiovascular Computed Tomography has updated the coronary artery model specifically for uh, cardiac or coronary CT angiography. And this was first published in 2009. This is essentially uh, a multi-segment model which allows you to separate the coronary arteries into the left main, sections of the left anterior descending, the diagonals, the circumflex artery, whether or not it's a dominant vessel with a left posterior lateral or post left posterior descending, and whether or not there's a ramus intermediates branch, and the right coronary artery, either a dominant or non-dominant circulation. Now there are three additional components to what had been originally described in 1975 by the American Heart Association. And these involve a total discrimination of the particular anatomy by adding a definition for the ramus branch, for adding the possibility of a left-sided posterior lateral branch, and for a left-sided posterior descending. So this is the basis of what we use for all segmental coronary analysis using cardiac CT. Now again, you need to understand other characteristics, not only the arteries, but the veins. You need to understand that the anterior cardiac vein parallels the left anterior descending coronary artery and can be an issue that you need to look at carefully. We have the right coronary marginal veins, which can be an issue. You need to look at the coronary sinus and you need to define the middle cardiac vein, which frequently accompanies the posterior descending or sometimes wraps around that. So you need to separate that all anatomically. How you read this is a presentation of the coronary anatomy. Now, when I was first introduced to coronary arteriography, I was defined what would be the anatomy. And the anatomy lies in a left-sided baseball grip. Basically, if you put your fingers in the air and you divide it into this particular characteristic, you can see in the left-handed baseball grip, you can see the left main artery, the left anterior descending artery, the circumflex, and the right coronary artery, including the posterior descending portion of the right coronary artery. This 
anatomy then allows you to manipulate in three-dimensional space these particular physical characteristics. So in fact we have an artery system mounted on a globe which is frankly the heart. Then you can do a variety of manipulations in that by defining the trajectory of the coronary arteries akin to following a particular latitude or longitude uh, on the globe. So this produces something called navigating the globe or what I prefer to call dead reckoning. If you depart from the path, that is you veer from the path of dead reckoning following a particular vessel, you may end up in China rather than Australia. So you need to be careful as to how you manipulate these and you are really a great GPS that must be updated on a continuous visual basis to allow you to manipulate down the coronary arteries. If you use this simple concept, you will find that the review of the coronary artery anatomy is very, very straightforward and relatively simple following a simple disciplined rule. So we start with a slab maximum intensity projection. Now this amounts basically to a fulcrum. So I have a slab of a particular thickness. Maybe we start, we prefer to start out with a three to five millimeter thick maximum intensity projection. One can then rotate that manipulation to get other views of other areas as we start navigating the globe and you perform the dead reckoning situation. So if I have a slab involving only this area, I can see the left main coronary artery and a proximal portion of the left anterior descending. I don't see at all the mid LAD. But if I take this same slab and I rotate it slightly, I start visualizing the portions of the mid left anterior descending. I can also reposition the slab to the mid left anterior descending and then rotate it again to view the rest of the LAD. So this way we vessel walk or dead reckon down the vessels and we can look at a variety of things including branches and other characteristics. So you first start with the left main coronary artery. You place the crosshairs in the middle and you rotate around and you rotate in any direction keeping the left main in the middle of the view and this way you can establish whether or not there are any left main problems. You then proceed down the left anterior descending looking at the proximal, mid, and distal segments and then returning to look again at the first and second diagonal segments. Again, dead reckoning down each of these individual segments. You then return to the left main and start looking at the circumflex artery. The circumflex artery can be uh, non-dominant, that it can be relatively small vessel, and you again, you dead reckon or vessel walk down these areas, looking at each of the individual segments, including the obtuse marginals. Sometimes the circumflex is the dominant vessel, and it's very important to establish left versus right dominance because then I can go on and look at the rest of the left circumflex vessel establishing the presence of the posterior descending and then when I go to look at the right coronary I should expect it to be relatively small and uh, therefore I, I don't waste time in terms of analysis. So if I have a dominant left circumflex then I should have a non-dominant small right coronary artery that generally tends to peter out basically uh, in the mid segment and this is a normal vessel. If on the other hand I have a non-dominant circumflex artery then I should absolutely be rewarded by looking at a dominant right coronary artery that allows me to look at the proximal mid and distal segments as well as the posterior descending and posterior lateral segments. So again I need to understand to complete the coronary anatomic views and complete, complete the circulation in terms of eye analysis. So again, when we're using coronary CTA, many people talk about this as a useful technique to define whether or not there is a 50% or greater stenosis. In reality, if you compare this with catheterization, the sensitivity for defining a 50% or greater stenosis is reasonably good using CTA. The specificity also is likewise very useful, but the positive predictive value is at best moderate at 60%. So with coronary CTA, part of the problem is I can certainly tell you if there's not obstructive disease, but the next step of telling you whether there is obstructive disease, my positive predictive value is only better, slightly better than a coin flip.
Now for ruling out a 50% stenosis to making sure that there is no evidence for obstructive disease by catheterization, the negative predictive value is 95%. Excellent, excellent negative predictive value. For defining plaque compared to IVUS, which is the gold standard for looking at that, its sensitivity is, seven, is 95%. So it's very, very sensitive for finding plaque. The specificity is also likewise very high. And the positive predictive value is likewise very high. So what we have here is that a CT angiogram is a superb method for defining the presence of plaque as compared to the gold reference standard of IVUS. It's a superb method for ruling out the presence of any evidence for obstructive disease. And it's a fair to midland technique for defining the presence of obstructive coronary artery disease. Couple examples here. Here is a CT angiogram. There is diffuse calcified plaque. There is a area of what we call mixed plaque, non-calcified and calcified plaque, but the lumen is not compromised. When we look at the subsequent CT uh, coronary angiogram, the direct invasive coronary angiogram, we are rewarded with a vessel that is clearly not obstructive, but the amount of information provided on plaque is superior from CT angiography as compared to direct coronary arteriography. Here's another example. Here is a CT angiogram showing a mild obstruction of a mid portion of the left anterior descending. When we look at the CT angiogram though, we can see that this, even though it's a non-obstructive lesion, represents a very significant area of non-calcified and calcified or mixed plaque within this region that would have been totally lost to the standard coronary arteriogram. So clinical outcomes are the most important thing. And when we're looking at CT angiography, there really are only three outcomes. No matter how much you squint and scrape, there's only three outcomes you can make. Number one, the study is totally normal. What we mean by totally normal is there's no calcified plaque and there's no non-calcified plaque. The luminogram is perfectly normal and we see no evidence for any plaque. The second is it's abnormal. Now it's abnormal because of the presence of mild, moderate, or even extensive, but non-obstructive plaque disease. And finally, abnormal with suspected or confirmed obstructive disease. The outcomes are different for these three individuals and that's the real value of CT coronary angiography. Number one, no further testing is required. This is an absolutely very sensitive and specific examination. The patient can be reassured and told to have a nice day. If we have the presence of plaque, secondary and tertiary medical therapy, whether it's statins or antihypertensive therapy or a variety of therapies need to be done, we've proven the patient has atherosclerosis, but they do not have anything that requires further intervention. And finally, we have an abnormal test where we have absolutely confirmed obstructive disease or we, we equivocate. We actually can't say whether or not there's obstructive disease. What that means is the patient needs further testing, whether that involves a physiologic testing such as nuclear stress testing or a direct a catheterization with intervention is unclear. That's a clinical scenario, but the fact is we are not done. So again, a normal exam means nothing needs to be done. An abnormal exam, but clearly not obstructive disease, means the patient probably needs medical therapy, but no further testing or intervention. And number three, an abnormal exam where there is either obstructive disease or equivocally obstructive disease in which further testing needs to be done. Now, there are guidelines for interpretation specifically because the biggest problem, the biggest question is defining non-obstructive versus obstructive disease. So there are some characteristics that you can look at to try to define or separate these out. If you have a normal segment, the answer is go to the next segment. Once you find an abnormal segment, you need to ask yourself several questions. Is there a calcified plaque? If it is present, is it eccentric or concentric? Eccentric plaque most commonly 
is non-obstructive disease. Concentric plaque is either equivocal or consistent with obstructive disease. Is there non-calcified plaque? If the answer to this question is yes, the same thing applies. Is it eccentric, which likely suggests non-obstructive disease, or concentric, which increases the likelihood of obstructive disease? What about motion registration artifacts? We have an entire lecture talking about multi-phase imaging because it's very important for you to look at multiple phases. This is what I call a beauty contest. You need to be able to look at several different phases to determine that the phase you're looking at represents the most accurate anatomic information. If it turns out that the uh, parameters change and you can clearly clear that by changing the phase, then there's no obstructive disease. If you cannot clear it, then that increases the likelihood of whether this is an equivocal obstructive lesion or an obstructive lesion. Minimal luminal diameter, which is based on a visual assessment, is also helpful. And minimal luminal area, which can be acquired by doing a quantitative CPR technique. Minimal luminal diameter should have at least two pixels or greater of luminal dimensions. And that corresponds to something that would suggest at least a millimeter to a millimeter and a quarter size vessel, which would be likely non-obstructive versus equal to or less than two pixels, which increases the likelihood of a vessel that's a millimeter or smaller. When you use the CPR, the technique for proximal vessels is greater than four millimeters square, squared is considered to be acceptable. Anything less than four millimeters squared in the proximal midsection of any vessel suggests the likelihood for hemodynamic significance. Opacification well, distally is another very simple characteristic. If you look at the density proximal to the lesion and you find that the density distal to the lesion is lower, then that increases the likelihood of obstructive disease. If it's similar to before the lesion, it really doesn't make any difference. It doesn't tell you one way or the other. Finally, lesion length is extremely important. This is borrowed from the catheterization laboratory. If we have a lesion length greater than 10 millimeters, this increases the likelihood that even if there is not significant focal disease, but because of the long lesion length, this also increases the likelihood for hemodynamic significance. And if it's less than 10 millimeters, that reduces the likelihood of it being hemodynamically significant. So in summary, one can look at indicators of possible obstructive disease, which is your major decision factor when you're trying to separate people out here. Concentric calcium, concentric non-calcified plaque, equal to or less than two pixels minimal luminal diameter, and or a minimal luminal area for the proximal vessels, less than four millimeters, and for the left main, less than six millimeters squared, a reduced opacification distally, and a lesion length greater than 10 millimeters. All of these parameters should be sort of checklisted in your review of the analysis to determine whether or not you think this is potentially obstructive or non-obstructive. Now, why is plaque severity so important? Why plaque severity is so more important than stenosis? Because we're not only talking about diagnosis of whether or not there's obstructive or non-obstructive disease, but we're talking about prognosis of the patient who has been identified to have atherosclerotic disease. The data are relatively clear. The less obstructive plaques give risk to more occlusions than did severely obstructive plaques because of their much greater number. And this is from the classic paper written by Dr. Folk and Dr. Fuster back in 1995 talking about coronary plaque disruption and uh, vulnerable plaques. Another paper, because the aggregate risk of rupture associated with many non-significant lesions exceeds that of the fewer significant lesions, a myocardial infarction will more likely originate from a non-significant lesion. This is a statistical situation. This is from another a very classic paper, Evaluation of the Culprit Plaque by Dr. Kern. So plaque volume, plaque severity is very important for looking at prognosis. A non-contrast CT, the coronary artery calcium score, CAC, remains, again, the most powerful intermediate and long-term predictor of future cardiac events. So my suggestion to you is that when you're doing CT angiography, perform a non-contrast heart scan in all patients who have no prior diagnosis of coronary disease. If the patient has had an intervention, such as a stent or a bypass, then there probably is no value in doing CT 
coronary artery calcium scanning before you do the diagnostic test. Again, there are very important plaque types then, outside the idea of whether it's obstructive or non-obstructive. A calcified plaque without the presence of any other plaque types is felt to be generally the most stable. The mixed type over on the right side suggests that there is calcified and non-calcified plaque, and this significantly increases the likelihood for this to become a culprit lesion in the future, whether or not it's obstructive. In the lower uh, left-hand corner, I have just a non-calcified plaque. This is non-obstructive, but the presence of the non-calcified plaque further increases the patient's uh, risk of having a disease. And finally, on the lower uh, right-hand corner, you can see an ulcerated plaque. This plaque actually has a contrast, if you will, in the mural surface of the coronary artery. And this is considered to be an ulcerated or a dissected plaque and is highly significant with or without obstructive disease to represent future problems with respect to prognostication. Coronary remodeling is a final characteristic that we need to look at. Uh, positive remodeling basically means that the artery has gotten bigger, but there is really no uh, limiting of the lumen size. Negative remodeling, which is really the characteristic given to significant obstructive disease, is the other end of the spectrum. So in this example shown here on the right, you can see that the lumen of the CT angiogram looks normal, but there is a combination of mixed plaque. You can see some mild non-calcified plaque and some calcified plaque. So even though there is no evidence for obstruction, this further enhances the subsequent prognosis of the patient that suggests for the interpreter to suggest that this patient perhaps be a bit more aggressively evaluated. You can define a remodeling index, if you will, on these characteristics. This is done by looking at uh, the uh, areas of the cross-sectional areas as well as diameters. And here's an example of a, a rather significant remodeling within a proximal LAD. There clearly is no obstructive disease, but there is significant uh, remodeling, and the remodeling index is 89%. So this increases, again, subsequent future risk of cardiac events and should be included uh, in your description of the results of the coronary CT angiogram.